How do we know, before we go into the Torah, how do we know God exists? We cannot prove that He exists with the five senses that he, we have. We can smell Him, we can taste Him, we can see Him, we can hear Him, we can touch Him. In that case, how can we prove that He exists? The answer to that is, you see the creation, you're learning about the Creator. The more sophisticated is the creation, it indicates about the brilliance and the ability of the great Creator. We have a rule in life. Everything that we're going to see and to hold in our hands, every creation that we ever approach in our life, a laptop, a projector, a table, a chair, a light bulb, anything, you name it, anything that was ever created, we know that if there is a creation, that has to be a creator. Coming to say that this beautiful creation with billions of stars, galaxies, oxygen, water, everything, people, animals, two million different kinds of animals, trees, flowers, so many brilliant things in a creation. Coming to claim that something like this happened with a random explosion and everything started to expand out of nowhere and, and then it started to develop with certain evolution and one thing leads to another, it's also not exactly clever to claim such a claim. But when the professors are saying it in university, everybody buys it. They live with that, they learned it, they got to test on it, they pass the test, and then they become professor, and excuse my language, they continue to teach this nonsense to another 10 million people, and they will teach it to 100 million people, and I promise you, not even one of them believe what he's preaching. Why? Every normal human being know if there is a chair, there must be a carpenter. I don't know him, but I'm willing to swear on my life that the carpenter made it. If there is a laptop, there's some kind of Japanese engineer that made it. I'm willing to swear on it. I don't have to know him. If I go to the moon and I see a Coca-Cola cane, I know somebody was there before me, he didn't get there by itself. If there is a creation, there must be a creator. The more brilliant the creation is, it indicates that the Creator is more brilliant. To make a chair, you don't need to be a genius. One day of training and you know how to make a chair. To make an F-16 airplane, you need 20 years of training. It's not enough one day. Why? It's a very sophisticated machine. The more clever the machine is, the more ability the Creator has. When we review a human brain, we take one brain, size of an apple, 10 trillion connection inside this little piece of jelly, 80% jelly, 20% raw material, 10 trillion connection in this little box. If we take all the telephone companies in the world, include all the satellites, Every wire out there, include all satellites of all the countries in the world combined, is not 1% of the dumbest person in the world. Take the dumbest person in the world, his brain is 100 times greater than all the telecommunication companies, including internet, all over the world. Just one brain of one person. Multiply it by 7 billion people in this generation, go back hundreds of generations before, take millions and millions of different monkeys, take all the two million different species, they all have brains, everything is connected, people have feelings, people have memory, everything is very, very sophisticated. Not to talk about the rest of the creation, I'm not even going into the galaxies and all the rest of the movements of all the galaxy, everything is in order, nothing collides, there is a supervision of every inch of the creation. To come and deny it, you can say whatever you want, but let's not fool ourselves. I don't believe there's one person in a history that really believed that everything was made by itself and there's no supervisor. It's not realistic. Did you ever see 
any creation point one ever in history, anywhere in the world, in any culture, in any country, in any language, any kind of creation that was made by anyone that did not have a purpose, if the most sophisticated creation is the world and mainly the human being, and his brain and liver and heart and veins and the nerve system and thousands of thousands of different systems in his body. It's a beautiful creation, a great machine with gr unbelievable abilities. Is it possible that the Creator made the human being without a purpose? Is it possible that he made him just like that for no reason? It's not realistic. There has to be a reason. So that leads us to the next question. What good is the answer that there is a purpose to the life of a human being without knowing what it is? Did you ever see in life a normal human being that it doesn't bother him? What am I doing in this world? 6.4 billion people, so many people running around, business, marriage, children, animals, food, all kinds of things. What am I doing here? The creator that put me here, what does he want from me? Why did he give me seven years of life? Is it possible that this creator, which is so sophisticated, he puts us here with a purpose and never bothered to tell us the purpose. Nobody ever knew the purpose, nobody knows what to do, so what are we living for? What's the point of living? Why dying, why living, why being sick, why being rich, why being poor, get married, have children, not get married, suffer, what's all this? Has a, reason, a purpose without, without any, any instructions? Of course not. The rule, the first rule is that if there is a book that was given by the creator of the world to people, if we're going to find one mistake in that book, one human error, from that moment on, it's not going to be wise to continue to waste time on that book. You can read it if you're curious, but obviously you cannot continue to claim that this book is divine. Why? People like Albert Einstein and other genius people, as genius as they may be, they make mistakes. No one is perfect. But when the book claimed to be the book of God, we expect God to be a superpower that is completely perfect. If it's capable of making human errors, we cannot rely on one word of what he said. Because if he tells me that I have to put a feeling every day, maybe it's his second mistake. If he tells me that I have to observe the Sabbath, and for that is going to reward me greatly, maybe it's a second mistake. If he tells me to get married, maybe that's his second mistake. How can I rely on him after he already proven to me once that he's able to make mistakes? It's enough that I find one time that he made such like geographical mistake, mathematical mistake, contradiction in his books, in the chapters. One time he said one number and the next chapter he said a different number. So that's a memory problem. From that moment on, I cannot rely on that book. My next step right now is, now I come and I throw a bomb here. What is my bomb? I claim, I claim that there is one book in history, only one, that was given to millions of people in a public event. They have one representative, one representative from them, which was Moshe ben Amram, Moses in English. Moses spoke to God, God gave him the Torah, in front of millions of people from the nation of Israel. This is before Israel became Israel. We were first the Hebrews at that moment. After the Torah was given, we became the Jews. Their Jewish religion officially started. We 
are the only religion who started in front of millions of witnesses. We didn't believe a story of a person who came from nowhere and told us God spoke to me or gave me a book. No, absolutely not. The opposite, when God came to Moses and he told him go and save the nation of Israel out of Egypt, they're all slaves, the answer of Moses was anyway they won't believe me that you spoke to me. They'll say I'm a liar. And God didn't get angry at him. What did he tell him? They're right. Why should they believe you? Just because you come and say that I spoke to you, they should believe you? No. I will speak to you in public, in front of all of them. When you bring them around the mountain, and after that, they will be leaving you for eternity. And that's exactly what happened. Now, I'm going to prove to you that this book, that I'm claiming that it's the book of God, is for sure the book of God. I'm going to prove it to you in, in few minutes. How am I going to, sh to prove it to you? Now you're going to see. The written Torah said to the Jews, everything you're going to eat from the ocean, you need to check two things before you eat it. If it has fins and scales, it's kosher. So now, we went fishing somewhere in a lake. We caught a fish. We see that the fish is smooth, it doesn't have any scales. You can scratch it, nothing falls. We know right away this fish is not kosher, but we don't know the fish, we never saw it before. How do we know it's not kosher? It doesn't have scales. The Torah says fins and scales. Two witnesses to say that it's kosher. Fins and scales. If the fish or anything you took out of the ocean doesn't have fins and scales, don't touch it, it's not kosher. comes the Oral Torah, and the Oral Torah make a statement. Kol sheyesh lo kaskeset, yesh lo snapir. Every species that you're going to find in the water, every water you're going to search, that have, as you can see here, that have scales, must have fins, guaranteed. How many kinds of fish we know today? More than 40,000 different kinds of fish. Just fish. Let's not include the scorpions, the turtles, the, the snakes, and so many other things that we have in the ocean. Just fish alone, 40,000 different kinds of names. The Torah say, if you picked up the fish and it has scales, don't worry. I guarantee you that it has fins. Kol sheyesh lo kaskeset, scales, for sure have fins. Which means, if one person, from the time the Torah was given, 3,300 years ago, if one person ever would bring a fish or anything from the ocean, a snake, that has scales but doesn't have fins, that's the end of the Torah, the end of Judaism, immediately. No more Yom Kippur, no more Pesach, no more Shabbat, no more Tfilin, no more Kosher, no more nothing. Why? First mistake in the Torah. If there is a mistake in a book, it cannot be from God. God doesn't make such mistakes. Why? He created all nature. He said in his book, I never made anything in the ocean with scales and without fins. If there is scales, I guarantee you there are fins as well. How much water we have in the world? Who knows? 72% of the world is water. Look at the globe, it's all blue. Three quarters of the world is water. 12 kilometers deep. That's how deep it is. That, it's much, much deeper. So far, they reached a place in the bottom of the ocean, 12 kilometers, eight miles. Eight miles from here to Manhattan or, or maybe to Queens even. That's how far inside. There are trillions of things that are moving in all the oceans and the lakes and the rivers and the pools and in museums and scientists are always mixing between all kinds of species. 3,300 years until today, nobody ever found something that has scales and doesn't have fins. And if they do once, we have a big problem in the Torah. Now I want to ask you a question. Is it possible that a human being was able to write such a thing 3,300 years ago? 
To write such a thing, this is the skills you, have to, you need to have. First, you have to be able to watch simultaneously 72% of the world, which is, look at the entire globe, is blue. It's all water. Three quarter of the world is water. You have to watch simultaneously the entire species, all of them that moves in all the rivers and all the lakes. And to promise, there is not even one in all the lakes and all the rivers and all the pools. Not even one that has scales and doesn't have things. The writer of the Torah promised you will never find one ever. What human being was able to know such a thing? Who could write such a thing? Only the creator of all the oceans. Only the creator of all the fish. Only the creator of all the scientists. Only the one who controls the future perfectly. Who is he in that case? The creator of the world. The Torah said, which animals are kosher, which animals are not kosher. There are two million animals that we know today. Two different kinds of, two million different kinds of animals. One, two, three, all the way from here to China. What do you think? That God's gonna write in the Torah all the names of all the animals in a, in a creation? Of course not. Who has patience to read two million names? So God gives us a formula. Two witnesses. It always worked like this. Two witnesses. By the fish, it's fins and scales. By the animals, split hooves and chew is cut. Mafris parsa u gera. Two signs to make sure that the animal is kosher. If the animal re-vomit the food and re-chew re it and swallow it again, and this is a cycle that the animal digests the food few times, that's called ma'ale gera. If the hooves of the animal is cut, there is a cut in the middle, it's called ma shosea chesa mafris parsa ma'ale gera. Two signs. So the Torah says, if you have two signs in the animal, they are kosher. You don't have two signs in the animal, they are not kosher. But be careful. God says in the Torah to the Jews, be careful. There are four exceptional animals. Four exceptional animals. The unique. They may trick you. If you don't be careful, they will trick you. Each one of the four have only one sign of kashrut. Not two, which means, who are the four animals? The camel, the pig, the rabbit, and the hare. Hare, it's like the rabbit, almost the same. Four out of two million that we know today, two million. Only four has one sign. Why do I tell you this? I didn't come to teach you which animals are kosher and which animals are not. Only for one reason. If one person will bring another animal somewhere in the world, anywhere, Zimbabwe, Brazil, Africa, anywhere you want, he will bring another animal and say, hey, look, this animal has split hooves, but it doesn't chew its cud. It has one sign, or it chew its cud, but it doesn't have split hooves. So that will be five different kinds of animal, not four like the Torah say. That will be the first mistake in the Torah. God say only four animals are exceptional. Only four. And here we are, we found the, five, the fifth one. So the Torah wasn't precise. If the Torah is not precise, how can we, we rely on this God? The Torah says that every Jewish male born has to be circumcised in eight days. Now we know that we have in our body vitamin K that help to clog the blood, clogging every wound that we have in our body. It's very interesting. If you take five quarts of blood and put it inside a balloon and make a hole in a balloon, the blood will drip for two, three hours until everything will be on the ground. The blood will not clog the hole in a balloon that you just made. It will continue to drip for hours until there will not be any blood left. But when it comes to our body, if you get cut anywhere in the body and the blood begins to drip, after four or five minutes, somebody told this blood, 
you better close the hole before this person will die. So what happened? The blood dries out and clogs the hole completely and the life of the person gets saved. Now, what creates this process? Vitamin K. Vitamin K in our body. Of course, in the time when the Torah was given, nobody even knew what vitamin K is. And the Torah ordered us to circumcise our babies in the eight days. Everybody asked, why in the eight days? Let's do it in the third year day. The baby is stronger. Let's do it after two months. What's the rush? Eight days is nothing. It's like a chicken, this kid. Give him a month. The Torah always know better. It just takes us sometimes 3,000 years to find out. The Torah says, in the eighth day, you have to circumcise every Jewish male born. Now, this is what the scientists have to say. In a research that was made in New York in 1953, the scientists, which are not Jewish, they publish that from zero to eight days, you have problems, it's not enough vitamin K to clog any cut that the baby may have. But in the eight days, some miracle begins to happen. The level of the vitamin K goes up tremendously. From the eight days until the rest of the person's life, he has 100% of vitamin K. But there is only one day in the life of the baby, one day, not two, one that he gets extra 10%, 110% vitamin K only in the eight days of the life of the baby. One day from 70 years. Who knew it, 3,000 years, that there's one day in the life of every man that he has extra 10% vitamin K? Is it coincidence? I don't think so. One time, remember, in the old days there was no calendar. Two witnesses came and saw the renewal of the moon. They went to the Jewish court and say, Today it's Rosh Chodesh. We just saw the moon renewed. But the rabbis that were sitting in the court, they were prepared for today, approximately around five in the evening, that the witnesses will start showing in court. How did the rabbi know? They receive it from generation to generation all the way until Moshe Rabbeinu gave this information when he came down from the mountain. God told him a secret. Why am I showing you that? Only for one reason. To show you that what I'm going to show you right here, no human being in history was able to know. Only the creator of the moon, the creator of the sun, the creator of the people, he is the only one who could have write such a thing. What is it? Here. 200 witnesses came to court that day. It was a foggy day. They came to Rabban Gamliel. He was sitting in a court waiting for them. They came a few minutes earlier. Let's say they were, it was supposed to be Rosh Chodesh around 5. They came at 4. Rabbi, we just came to testify, we saw the renewal of the moon. Please announce today, it's the beginning of the month. Why they have to announce? Remember, there's no calendar. Because if they announce that today it's Rosh Chodesh, now we're going to count 14 days. And in the 14 days in the evening, we're going to celebrate Lela Seder, Passover night. We go by what the rabbis announced, because we don't have a calendar. 200 witnesses came. And Rabban Gamliel told them, you all wrong. Not two witnesses, 200, all standing in a court. Rabbi, we saw the renewal of the moon. What are you telling us now? This is what he answered. I received from generation to generation. Every time the Gemara says, it means it's tradition in our hand that Moshe came down from Mount Sinai and God told him this information in the mountain. What is it? The renewal of the moon can never be less than 29 days and a half and two thirds of the hour and 73 parts of the minute. Let's calculate, 29 days, everybody knows what it is. And a half, half a day, it's 12 hours. Two thirds of the hour, how long is that? 40 minutes, two-thirds of an hour, 
73 parts of the minute, take 60 seconds, divide to 73. What are you getting? 29.530590000. Let's see what, the, what NASA found out. NASA, this is an original copy of NASA, Earth Moon System. There, after years of researches, one after the other, satellites, computers, thousands of employees, billions of dollars from the taxpayer money, what did they find? The renewal of the moon, the minimum, the, lo the lowest renewal of the moon is 29.530. 588. What's the difference between the Americans and the Torah? Two hundred thousandths of a second. Take a second, cut it to a hundred thousand equal pieces, take two of them out, that's the difference between the Torah and what the measurements of NASA. If you think that that's the end of it, the Germans are always a little bit more yekes than the Americans. And what did they find? In 1965 in Berlin, what happened? The Germans became closer to the truth. They came 29.530589. Now the difference is 100,000 of a second. 100,000 of a second. Now tell me please, you're all intelligent, I'm sure. Show me one person two, three thousand years ago when the Torah was given from father to son in a generation that there was not even a calculator, no watches, no mega computers, no computers at all, no satellites. Who was able to give millions of people a book and tell them the renewal of the moon that you see over there is precise to a millionth of a second, to a hundred thousand of a second. Who would even know what a hundred thousand of a second is? Even 50 years ago, but nobody knew. We don't have to go 3,000 years back. This is a clear proof, and nobody can answer against it. This is a clear, precise proof that the book that we have in our hand is the book that was given to us by the Creator of the world. And you know what? You know what's the best news? right next to it, right next to it. It says, you are the Jew, you must keep the covenant that I made with you is the Sabbath. You must keep Shabbat. You want to belong to my nation, you want to earn eternity, I made a covenant with you, the Jewish nation, to keep the Shabbat. The earth is turning around itself every 24 hours, it's finished a full circle. As it's turning around itself, it goes and finish a whole year, 365 days finishing the entire circle around the sun. Why do we need to know that now? Here we have a book that was written 2000 years ago. And of course it's based on what we receive in Mount Sinai in the Torah. That's what called Kabbalah, the mystical parts of Judaism. We have six discoveries that shock the world and that's 1500 years before the non-Jewish scientists discovered it. Until this moment, they got the credit for their discoveries even though it was written black and white in the Torah and Judaism in Zohar. Zohar was written 2000 years ago in Israel by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And let's see what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai knew already 2000 years ago. First, the whole world is turning around like a ball. Not only is round, it's turning around itself. Two major discoveries in one sentence. Then, there are people on the bottom of the ball, there are people on top. Right there, it's gravity. There are people in the bottom and they're not falling to space. There are people upside down. As a matter of fact, this building, if you go on a satellite outside of Earth, and you'll be able to see Manhattan. You may see Manhattan, the entire Manhattan is in the bottom of the ball. We could be upside down. We all, the opposite, all right? The head is down, the buildings are down. It's turning around like a ball. There are people on the bottom and there are people on the top of the ball. 
Now, and the people who live in different parts of the ball, they are different in their image and the color of their skin based on the weather and the air that they breathe in each place where they live. Now, the Zohar continues and say, there's a place in the world that once it's darkness to those, it's a day for the others. So now he knew how the earth is facing the sun. In one side is day, the other side is night. And then there's a place in the world that you cannot find their night only in a very limited time. In the North Pole, you have six months, light, six months dark. But even in the six, in the tw 24 hours that you, that you have in a day, it's all light. What do you find over there? That there is a very short period of time, something like an hour, that it becomes dark for about an hour, oh, and right away it becomes sunny again. It's interesting. How did he know? He never went to the North Pole. You know how? How do I know? The first time in history that a person stepped in the North Pole was 1908, exactly a hundred years ago. So in the time of the Zohar, nobody knew even that there's a place over there because nobody went there. The world was different than today. No airplanes, you know, it was only maybe some boats and that's it. So this is just to give you information that no human being could, could give such information 2,600 years ago. The Torah says the western wall, the Kotel Amaravi, will never fall down. God promised that the western wall of the temple will never collapse. If the western wall in Jerusalem one day will fall down, earthquake, the Arabs would shoot a missile on it, I don't know, whatever the case may be, God forbid, that moment will be the end of Judaism. Not only the end of the wall, which is a souvenir from Bet HaMikdash, no! The wall, what's the wall? You can rebuild the wall, it's no big deal. It will be the end of Judaism, the end of everything, why? The Torah promised that God swore that the wall will never fall down. Now I have some news for you. The first temple was destroyed 2,600 years ago by the Babylonians. The second temple was destroyed 2,000 years ago by the Romans. The wall had, the Bet HaMikdash, the temple had four walls around it. One, two, three, and four. And the temple was in the middle. When the Babylonians came, they knocked down the walls. When the Romans came, they knocked down the walls. In between, the Greeks came and they burned Bet HaMikdash. Three major attacks on the Holy Temple and somehow, nobody can explain, the Western Wall is still standing. Now I want to ask you a question. When a Goy comes to destroy Bet HaMikdash, what incentive he has to leave a wall completely standing? He came to destroy everything. Why would he leave the wall standing? Once? Twice? Three times? No, not three times. Hundreds of times. Hundreds of times in the last 2,000 years, do you know how many wars took place around the, water, the Kotel over there? Earthquake, wars, Saljukim, Persians, Muslims, British, Turkish, Armenians. So many empires occupied and destroyed Jerusalem. Nobody touched the wall. Why? God promised the wall will stay there forever, I'm protecting it. Four walls were made in the same day from the same material. Three of them fell down in an hour, one of them is standing forever. Do you know a human being that will write in his book, even the biggest faker in the world that tried the fact that God gave him a book? Let's say he came to fool us. Why would he take such a risk to write in his book, this wall will never fall down. What, are you crazy? I'm gonna knock down the wall and I prove that your book is nonsense. All I have to do is to knock down the wall.
Nobody can knock down the wall. Even if you go tomorrow with a plan, Hashem promised to protect it. Until 400 years ago, until Galileo Galilei, nobody thought that there is more than 6,000 stars in the world. People used to stand on a mountain and count. Here, one, two, three. In a bright night, maximum they were able to count is 6,000. If you told a person a thousand years ago, or two thousand years ago, or three thousand years ago, that there are trillions of stars, you would know right away that you're crazy, you're not normal. Where are you bringing trillions of stars? Here, 6,000 stars, what? You're making up numbers? The Jews always told the Goim, there are much more stars than what you can see. The Goim say, you are the Jews are weird. You always have weird things. Where are you getting these numbers from? So the Jews say, we got the Torah from the creator of the world. He told us how many stars he made. You did not get it. That's why you think we are weird. Here, I'll give you an example. This is a part from the oral Torah right here. Page 32, Masechet Brachot. In the Gemara. The nation of Israel came to God to complain. Dear God, a, per a person got divorced with his wife. And let's say a few years later, he got remarried. Let's say 20 years after he got divorced, you come and ask him, Hey, Moshe, do you, rem you remember your ex-wife Rachel? What is the answer going to be? No? Of course you remember her. How can he forget her? Even 40 years later, you ask him, Do you remember if one day you were married? He said, Of course, I had a wife. Of course, he remember everything. So the nation, of, the nation of Israel comes to God and say, Dear God, a person never ever forget his ex-wife. And you left us and you forgot about us completely? What was the message? The message was the second temple was destroyed. The Goim threw us out of the Holy Land. We have no life anymore and you left us alone. What was the answer of God? Listen to this. Amazing. Amar la Kadosh Baruch Hu and God answered. My daughter, BT. Very nice that God calling us his daughter. You are my daughter, the nation of Israel. Twelve section I created in heaven. Twelve section, that's by the way the horoscope. The horoscope is twelve different signs. Each sign is 30 degrees. A circle is 360 degrees. If you divide it to twelve slices, each slice is 30 degrees. That's where the horoscope comes from Judaism, of course. Not like some Jews think that it comes from the Greek or from the other nations. Twelve section I created in heaven. And in each section I created 30 armies. And in each army I created 30 legions. In each legion I created 30 raton. In each raton I created 30 karaton. In each karaton I created 30 gistera. In each gistera I hung 365,000 multiplied by 10,000 stars. And all of that I created for you, the nation of Israel. And you have the nerve to tell me that I forgot about you and I left you? This is direct words of God to the Jewish nation 2,000 years ago, after the destruction of the second temple. Let's calculate the math, 12 section, 12 times 30, times 30, times 30, 30, 30, times 365,000, times 10,000, it gives us 10 to the power of 19 stars. 1 and 18 zeros. Very long number. Quad a trillion. I don't even know how to say this number. And the interesting thing is, remember, this was written in a generation that there was no telescope. Everybody thought there are 6,000 stars. And here comes the book, the Jewish book, the Torah. And the Torah says, what are you talking about 6,000? 
There is one in 18 zero stars. You cannot see them, but they exist. In 1608, Galileo Galilei raised this telescope to the sky and he found there's a lot more galaxies that we, we couldn't see. Between then until today, NASA is very advanced and they found out that there is 10 to the power of 19 stars. In case you had a doubt, here it is in front of you. In 1990, Dr. T. Bruhers from Queen Mary College in London had a research with mega computers and he found there's 10 to the power of 19 stars in universe. It doesn't really matter what the scientist finds. It shouldn't impress us at all. Because we have to follow the Torah, the divine Torah that God gave us. But once the scientists find something that match exactly what the Torah knew 3,000 years ago, it leaves us very impressed. Not because of the scientists. They deserve the respect. I'm not saying no. Because it's not so simple to find what they find. But we have to be impressed from the book that we have in our hand. Each one of us has it in the house. Some of us forget to open it. It's very dusty. But Torah in Hebrew means instruction. For those of you who thought maybe a faker brought it, or maybe the rabbis made it up, get it out of your head. Why? It's impossible. The more you learn the Torah, the more you see that these laws are above human. It's way deeper than human understanding. And not only that, the Torah says clearly, don't try to analyze my laws and understand them in your brain. My ways and your ways are not the same. Your ways compared to my ways is like comparing an eagle to a worm on the floor. That's what the Torah says. So get it out of your head. You and me are not equal. I am the creator and you are the creation. A creation does not understand the creator. So if you don't understand the logic in the laws, it doesn't mean you're allowed to ignore it. How many examples like this you think I can give you? If I want it. Without exaggerating, I could stay with you here straight, without sleeping, until next Sunday and give you hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of examples like this that show that the Torah can never be written by a human being. Never! Take the smartest person ever lived. Give him all the equipment, give him all the scientists, all the genius people from all the nations, from all the generation combined. They won't be able to write one page in the Torah. And you know what's the best part? Right next to it, it says that the Jew has to put a feeling on his brain and on his heart every day. Right next to it. In the same divine book, it's not two different gods. Same one who gave us a divine book with all this knowledge. Same one told us in the Torah, Banim atem Hashem elokechem. You, the Jews, are my only children. I chose you from all the nations to be mine because I loved your father Abraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov. Do me a favor. Don't behave like the Gentiles. Why? The Gentiles made so many despicable sins in front of me that I got sick and tired of them. If you don't believe me, it's right inside the text. את כל התועבות האלה עשו הגויים האלה ועקוץ בם. קץ אין היברו מין אנד. I had it with them. When you ask a Christian priest, how do we know that your book is really the book of God? His answer would be, check, if you don't believe, check. We have to believe, son. We have to believe, but I don't want to believe, I want to know. Things that are spiritual cannot be proven. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of emunah. We have to believe and they were born with belief and they die with belief. That belief never turned into a fact. It's a matter of you want to believe, believe. You don't want to believe, there's no way to prove anyway. Same thing in Islam, there's no way to prove. 
Well, it's a story of one man. He did not bring any witnesses. Nobody know if it really happened or not. Same thing Mary. One day she had a dream. She claimed God came to her and made her pregnant. How many witnesses saw that God came to her while she was sleeping? Not even one, of course. There's no way to prove a dream. And when Muhammad showed up from the desert, as the Quran say, he came by himself. So nobody ever saw it. And when Buddha came 2,400 years, and, uh, 2400 years ago and he claimed he saw the light, how many people witnessed that? Nobody, because it was only his story. And all these cults were starting with the story of one man, nobody can back it up. It's a matter of fact. But in Judaism is the total opposite. It's not a matter of faith. It's something that if you check for one hour the details, you know one million percent God really gave it. And that changed all the rules. Having a book in my hand that it's a 50-50. Maybe God gave it, maybe not. It's a big dilemma. Would I live 70, 80 years according to these rules and then one day I die and I find it was all baloney? Nothing, it's not from God. Or if the book, I know 100% is the book of God, that's a different story. Now I'm willing to sacrifice. Let's talk a little bit about Christianity. In the Torah it says that Jacob went to Egypt with 70 people. In the New Testament it says that Jacob went to Egypt with 75 people. What happened to God? He forgot? It was 70. Now they claim it's the New Testament. It's a continuation of the Torah. Part 1, part 2 from the same God. In part 1 it says 70. Part 2 all of a sudden God forgot. It's 75. It says in the Torah that Abraham bought Me'arat HaMachpelah that it's in the city of Hebron from Ephron Achiti. There was a guy, his name was Ephron. And New Testament, all of a sudden, they say that they bought it from Shechem, from son of Hamor in Shechem, Nablus. They say that Me'arat HaMachpelah, it's not in Hebron, it's in Nablus. What happened to God? He doesn't know where Me'arat HaMachpelah of Abraham, Yitzchak and Yaakov is. The only book who kept originally as it is, is the Torah. 80,000 religions and cults, they cannot point which book is the original one that they received because they have so many different versions. How many different New Testaments are in the world? You know, more than 150,000. Each one is different than the other. Over the generations they were copying, they make mistakes. 150,000 different texts. The Quran, hundreds of texts. Torah, one Torah all over the world. The Ashkenaz Jews, the Yemeni Jews, the, uh, the Syrian Jews, the Persian Jews, they all gathered in Israel a hundred years ago, eight years ago, they opened up the Torah, same Torah. 304,805. When all nations were after the Jews to destroy them and to destroy their Torah, it bothered the Goim that the Jews have this divine book, and they did everything they can to forbid the Jews from learning Torah. The Romans, the Babylonians, the Philistines, Amalek, who knows, Rome, everyone. The Jews are here, all of them are gone, and the religion has thousands of different books or hundreds of thousands of these books. But the Torah, the same one. Without internet, without telephone to verify. The Yemeni Jew came to Yemen, from Israel, to, to Israel, opened the Torah. Oh. Same Bereshit Bara Elohim. Persian Jew came from Tehran, opened, same thing. Polish Jew came from Poland, opened, same thing. Mezuzah, same thing. Filin, did you ever see Filin that is not black? Did you ever see Brit Milad that they cut a different part in the body? Imagine. Oh, no, Rabbi, we have different opinions what Brit Milad is. Why? The truth is always the truth. The truth of God is the same from the beginning of the world until the last day in this world. It will never change. I had a famous debate, it's on YouTube and also on the website. Three hours slashing the New Testament to pieces. That by the end of the debate, the Christian priest say, you put me in a hole, I don't know, I'm gonna get myself out of there. That's how successful it was, why? Every page full of mistakes. He didn't know where it, he couldn't finish. 
I gave him, sh I shot hundreds of mistakes, one after the other, he, he started, his head started to spin. How is it possible that there are 25 mistakes in a book that claim to be from God? It's impossible that God made mistake in a text. This is, we conclude that. Question number two, if Jesus is the son of God, who needs to waste time to prove from King David all the way to Joseph when we say Joseph is not the father? Third question, please explain me how do you have more than 150,000 different versions to the New Testament? Please explain me how there are more than 150,000 different texts. Okay, that's question number three. Question number four, please tell me, how is it possible that in the New Testament it says that Jacob went to Egypt with 75 people when everybody agreed that the Torah say that Jacob went to Egypt with only 70 people. That's what happened, why? Not because he's a fool, he's a professor for Christianity in Manhattan University for Christian Studies for 31 years. They chose the expert in New York to bring him to the debate. And what happened in the end? I told him, I just proved to you that your religion is false. He didn't say no. He said, but my heart doesn't let me leave it. I said, heart is nothing. The Muslim also think by his heart. Heart doesn't show the truth. Heart is heart, it's feelings. The truth sometimes is exactly the opposite of that. If it's divine, there cannot be mistakes. The rest of the book can be marvelous, beautiful. Copy from the Old Testament, copy from here, copy from there. Opinions, beautiful stories, miracles, happened, didn't happen. We don't even want to waste time of challenging the miracles. That's not even the issue here. Because I told you and, Je and Jesus himself admit that making miracles is not an indication of anything. The conclusion that I'm trying to make to Danny and his friend right here is very simple. Divine has to be perfect. One mistake, not 50, not 500. One mistake, one contradiction in a text, 25 mistakes in a descendants, the cave it's in, in Shechem, 75 people went with Jacob to Egypt and so forth and so on, the list is huge. I cannot go blinded after my feelings. Feelings means nothing. A lot of people, because of their feelings, they're in jail, they are killed already, their families are broken. The Judaism did not educate to go by your heart, by your feelings. For those who didn't know, when we receive the Torah, we receive the written and the oral Torah. Receive the written and the oral Torah. You cannot understand one word from the written Torah without, go without going to the oral Torah. The oral Torah explains all the secrets, all the secrets of the written Torah. You won't understand anything. You won't know how to do circumcision. You won't know how to keep Shabbat. You don't know how to make tefillin. You don't know what mezuzah is. You don't know. Without the oral laws, all the instructions were given to us verbally, separately. If everything would be in one book, all the goyim would, obviously they copy the Torah to their languages. As soon as the Torah was given to the Jews, the whole world copied it and translated it to their own language. Once they had it, what would prevent all the goyim from becoming perfect kosher Jews, without conversion, without coming to the rabbi to be tested. Beard everyone had. To make tefillin, they have all the instructions, so they make the tefillin. Tzitzit, they know how to make, because they read the instructions, so they make tzitzit. They keep Sabbath, because they know it's in the book. So everything would be in the book. Two or three generations later, you wouldn't know who is a real Jew and who is not. One person has a Jewish soul, the other one doesn't have a Jewish soul. It comes from different spiritual worlds, the souls. A soul of a Jew and a soul of a Goy comes from different worlds and go to different worlds. Don't go into the same sections in heaven. So, how would you know? You have now all the Jews coming in a synagogue. Few of them are descendants of Goyim. 3,000 years ago, his grandfather, he pretended that he's a Jew, he had all the written laws. 
He knows how to be religious, he doesn't need a rabbi. So the answer is, God was not interested to create such a mess. He wanted the Jews to have the real secrets verbally only in yeshivot from rabbi to student. God did not make the covenant, the covenant with the Gentiles. Only with his family, the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He took Jacob and changed his name to Israel. And he said, I'm going to follow the covenant with your descendants, Israel. The God of Israel. That's how he named himself. He didn't say the God of the world, the God of the Gentiles. Never. The God of Israel. I am your God. Always. To leave no doubt. I created the whole world for the nation of Israel, for my children. Everything here, every things that I operate, everything that I do here, the main thing, the purpose of this creation is the nation of Israel. If the nation of Israel will be destroyed, then you know a minute before that there is not going to be any earth. Because God does not this, need this place unless if his nation will be here. That's why I promised in the Torah, I swore to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that I will never replace their descendants with any other nation. Even though they're going to get punished from the way they behave, and only very few of them will survive, you know for sure that the same way I am God will never be different, the nation of Israel will never be destroyed. It's a prophecy, clear prophecy. The whole world is for my nation Israel. יפה שעה של קורת רוח בעולם הבא מכל חיי העולם הזה. One hour of pleasure in the next life will be equal to more than all this life in this earth. What does it mean? Take all the people who lived here from the time of the creation until today, thousands of years. Multiply by millions and billions of people that lived here and still alive here. Take and gather together all the pleasures they ever had. Take all their money, women, sport, massages, vacation, air condition, fancy cars, jet ski, I don't know what. Whatever you want. Any hobby you can think of, delicious food, uh, movies, comedies, relations, everything combined of all the people and their entire 78 years of life, every day's pleasure accumulate everything in one huge mountain of pleasure. Food, money, sports, fame, music, glory, clothing, jewelry, you name it. Add everything in one huge pile of trillions of people combined. Multiply all of it together, times 70 years of a life of all the people together will not be equal to one hour of the reward of one religious Jew in the next life. And what are we going to lose it for? For our stupidity. You should do what's straight and correct in the eyes of your God, not your eyes. According to your eyes, to take drugs, drugs is good. According to your eyes, to be a gambler is good. According to your eyes, all day sit and watch TV is good. According to your eyes, to sleep in bed all life is good. Everyone has a different good. Everyone defines good in a different way. If every person would give a speech about what he thinks is correct to do, then why Adolf Hitler is wicked? Why? That's his opinion, that you have to exterminate all the Jews from the world. That's his decent and good, according to his opinion. Come Mustafa, he has also his own good. 
Come uh, Yitzchak, he has his opinion. Come the American guys that like baseball, for him that's the life. Everyone has a different thought. Everyone has a different good. So we are not capable of deciding what's the right thing and what not. We are the creation. The only one can define what's good is the creator of good. The one who made up that expression. The one who decides good and bad is the only one can decide what's really good. Because Hitler thought to kill an innocent baby just because their mother is Jewish is good. Go and prove to him that he's wrong. Without God, you don't have any proof. You don't have any proof. The Jews want to get rid of the terrorists. The terrorist wants to get rid of the Jews. Everyone has a different truth. Go and prove that it's good to get married. The people who are against marriage, they're going to show you that there are so many bitter marriages. There's no way to prove. Nothing. Are you allowed to decide how, what is the right way? No, your Creator already told you what's the right way. The only way to maintain civilized life with laws and dignity is by following the laws of the Creator. You don't have a Creator, you have nothing in your life. The word believing is already a very serious problem. Because in science, believing means not knowing. When a scientist say, I believe that an explosion will occur when we touch those two wires together, then we know it's not 100% sure. Can we gamble that it's going to happen? Would you put your money on his belief? No. But when a scientist say, we know for sure that once we touch those two wires, the building will go on fire, we know, the word know or believe is two different things. Jews that say we believe in God, they are the last in the list. Why? Because that means they just informed us that they have doubts if God exists or not. For instance, when someone asks me, you believe in God? I don't say yes. I say I know that God exists. Somehow they didn't see in different places in the Torah that the request from a human being, not only from the Jews, from humanity in general is to know God, not to believe in Him. To know Him, to know He's the boss, to know He's the creator, to know He runs the show, to know that every leaf that falls from the tree, if it goes left or right, needs His approval. Nothing can move an inch in this planet or any other place without His approval. And the request, the obligation is to know 100%, which means 99% it's still a big problem. Why? 1% doubt, it's a lot. 1% doubt, it's already having, uh, you're having some hesitations. Should I do, should I not do, maybe it won't work out. God wanted us to see that this place is only a temporary place. You're not going to be here forever. You are here 60, 70, 80 years. It's only a blink of the eye. It's a test. To earn eternity or to lose it, God forbid. But that's not the place of the reward. A blink of the eye. Before you realize it's over. Look at the 70, 75 years people. Tell them I want you to write on a piece of paper your entire life, from the day you remember yourself until this, until this moment. How many pages you think they can write? How many? Three, four pages, ten pages? How many pages they will conclude their life? Seventy years. Five, six pages, they conclude their entire life. Each day in reality worth billions for us. If we had the money and we had to buy an extra day of life, we would pay. Why don't we take advantage on it? Why are we grinding water? Why we waste our entire life? It's like a battery that dies every second. Why don't we say, wait a minute, Hashem puts me here, I have something to achieve. What, how, how much more time I'm going to lose? Before it's going to be too late for me. And remember, it's no free choice, it's a choice. In the end we have to pay. You got a credit card, you go shopping, you enjoy for a month, the bill will come another week. Now the interest begins. A lot of people get their first credit card, the next thing is see them with a nice car, nice suit. How are you doing, Moshe? Ah, you became rich, yeah! <laughs> $40,000 on a credit card. 15 years to pay the interest. 
So everything materialistic, he made it temporary. You cannot enjoy from it for, forever. You buy a beautiful mansion. How long you excited? One to two months you excited from your new home. After three months, it's already a way of life. You buy a new, a new sport car, the first night you don't go to sleep from the excitement. You go with your wife to the indoor garage three times a night to look at the car. Second night, twice a night. Third night, once a night. Then fourth night, you take a break. A month later, you don't even look at the car. In the first month, every scratch burns your heart. Two months, three months later, ah, this car, who cares about it? I'm planning to, re to replace it. Same thing, everything materialistic. I created them and I gave them a book of instruction. If they want to be successful, they have to have fear for me, respect. To know that I am the God and they are my creation and I'm controlling them 100%. But I gave them free choice. We are the only thing in nature that have a free choice to do good or bad. All the animals live by instinct. They don't have free choice. They see fire, they run. They see water, they jump. A tiger that is hungry sees a zebra, he attacks. You cannot come to the zebra, to the tiger and say, excuse me, tiger, we have 10 more minutes of shooting some pictures. We didn't finish. Can you wait 10 minutes before you attack the zebra? Right away he attacks, he doesn't care what's going on. Why? But a person, you can say, wait 10 minutes before you kill him. 10 minutes, we finish the pictures, then you kill him. So he's, he's controlling himself. Why? Because God gave him a free choice to do good or bad. And that's why we get reward and punishment. The animals don't have reward and punishment. There's no shells for lions. No lions went uh, on a trial for, for being a murderer. That murders every day. What's the difference between man to all other species? Naturally, physically, none. The animals are greater than us in every field. They run faster, they're stronger, whatever. There's only one advantage that a person has that the animals does not have. It's the divine soul that God put in his body, which is going to be judged after the time of death in front of God for the entire life. So, I have a question. Who say to go to a, to a tribe, it's, a, it's an advantage? Nobody wants to go to court. It's a punishment. The Torah said that it's an advantage. What's the difference between the mankind to animals? That a mankind has a divine soul, that when the time comes for him to leave the world, the soul goes to a tribe. Every mitzvah you kept, you get a reward for it. If you did something bad, you get punished for it. That's an advantage. We all know that most of us are sinners, not exactly righteous. So what advantage is that? It's not an advantage. Be better off not to have it. The answer is, since you had 100% free choice and you could have done everything correctly and to earn eternity full of pleasures, the fact that you did not do so is 100% your fault. And it's, this is an advantage, of course it's an advantage. But you didn't, didn't use this advantage to your own benefits, you didn't. The divine soul, that means you have a free choice to do whatever you want. The animals have no free choice. The animals live with instinct. Nobody in the world really knows, unless if he's ultra-orthodox, nobody really knows what's the purpose of life. You ask people on the street, you go to Wall Street, what's the purpose of life? To make money in the stock market. You go to the farmers, what's the purpose of life? To take care of the cows and the horses. You go to Hollywood, what's the purpose of life? To be a movie star. You go to the, to the stadiums over there in Israel and in Europe, what's the purpose of life? To make it to the team, to become a professional soccer player. You come to Harlem, what's the purpose of life? To become an NBA star, to get a contract. You go to, uh, I don't know, anywhere you want to go. What's the purpose of life? To be a rocker, to be uh, a player in a, in a band or something, you understand? Everybody design his own purpose of life. Now tell me please, who is the only one 
who is capable to describe the purpose of life? The creation or the creator? What do you think? Creator. Who knows better? We knows better or the creator knows better for us? If my creator gave me a book and inside the book I see right there as you can see that I am torturing you, I'm giving you hard time, to test you, Nisayon, test, to see what's in your heart. Are you going to keep my laws or not? That's it. Somebody ask you tomorrow, tell me please, what are we living for? Why God needed this whole world? Why he needed billions of people, animals, birds, fish? What does he need all this? Why we have all this Torah? Why we have all, all this mitzvot that 80% of that look weird to us? We don't even understand where the logic is. There's so many things that we will never understand. The secrets behind it. The answer is one sentence inside a divine book. You don't need more. What is it? I'm going to read it word to word. Leman anotcha. I'm giving you hard time. I'm choking you. I'm beating you up. I'm starving you. I'm taking away your job. I'm not finding your wife. You are barren. So many problems. Every person in the world has problems, with no exception. Everybody. Why? Why? Is this sadistic? Were you created us to make us suffer? The answer is no. Don't be a fool. Just read. Get educated. What is it? What I can do, you can also do. What's the difference? I learned. That's why I know the answer. You can also know. Leman, anotcha lenasotcha. I'm torturing you. But at the same time, the purpose of this suffering is to test you. Are you going to follow my orders or not? What's the point? Okay, let's say I'm going to follow your, your orders. What's the point? What's the answer? The answer is to reward you in your end. I am the faithful God that will pay you the reward that I promise in so many different places in the Torah. Soon we are going to talk about this reward. It's important for you to know what are you going to earn if you're going to dedicate some of your time to keep this load. You know why most Jews are not religious? Only one reason. And nobody ever was able to contradict what I'm about to tell you. I've been asking that for 15 years, not a day or two. None of the secular Jews, none of them, read the Torah carefully, even one time in their life, from the beginning to the end. Not even one! One, there's 11 million secular Jews in the world. Two million more or less are religious, more religious, less religious. That's the, that's the statistic. 20% religious, 80% not religious. This 80%, not to talk that most of them don't even know that they're Jews. They don't understand what's the difference. Bichlal. They're here, America, Mary, Goyim. have no idea what is Judaism. I'm talking those who know there is God and the Torah. They have so many speeches against the Torah, so many arguments against the religion. And in the end, they never read the Torah one time to understand the simple meaning of the word. Imagine I come to a convention of the brain surgeon in the world. I do not know how brain look. And I'm giving them one hour speech against the brain surgeries that they do. After five minutes, one of them says, excuse me, sir, you've been talking and talking and talking against the surgery. Where did you go to school? In Shkunat Atikva. Where is it? It's a neighborhood in Israel with all the gangsters sitting there selling drugs. That's where I went to school. Oh, so you didn't go to medical school? What medical school? You know better than me because you went to medical school? Why? You know about brain better than me? Why? Because you know you work with brain? I'll tell you how to operate. They put me in a mental institution. But against the religion, everything is kosher. Everything is acceptable. But come, come, we'll put you on the news. Come, we'll put you in the newspaper. Completely ignorant. He doesn't know one word in Rashi how to read. And he has beautiful lectures against the rabbi, beautiful lectures against the Torah. Where did we get to? 
How, where this chutzpah come from? Why don't you be honest and come and say, Sir, you have knowledge in Judaism. I'm a computer engineer. You come to argue with me about computer, I'll crush you. I'll come to argue with you about religion. You crush me, it's obvious. You have the knowledge here and I have the knowledge there. God cannot stand ignorant people that have the Torah on the shelf. They learn everything else except this. New York Times, he know all the dates by heart. All the commercials, the advertisement. Every stupid book that came out, he already read. Hours in the internet, politicians, this, news, that. Very nice. What about my Torah? How many hours a day you learn all your life? He knows the size of the shoes of Obama, the color of the underwear of George Bush, the, all the hats that Hillary Clinton has in her closet, everything he knows. Le simple Aleph Bet Shel Torah he doesn't know. How do you come and make statements? How can you contradict a book before you dedicated a day or two of your life to read it carefully? Maybe by then you realize that all your life is one big mistake. If you ask a person today, hey, dear Jew, define life for me. What does it mean, life? Here is the answer I heard. To enjoy every minute, to be rich, to look good, to be healthy, to work out, to go on vacation as much as possible, to have as many girls as possible, to have uh, nice cars, to have beautiful houses, to go on parties. Everybody has his own life, what he calls life. The Torah say, let's use our head for one second, it's a divine book. The Torah say, if you're going to listen to me and keep my laws, you will live. You will live. What do you mean, God? The guy, the Jew, that doesn't listen to you, he drives his Mercedes on Shabbat, he doesn't live. Look at him, he just eats steak, he smokes his cigar, he drives a nice car, he goes into a beautiful mansion, he has another house in Florida, he's very happy from his achievement. But you in your Torah say, if you're going to listen to me and follow my laws, you will live. Which means if you are not going to follow my laws, you are dead. But we all see that the people who don't listen to the laws of God, they're not dead. They lie, they play basketball, they, they, they eat very well, no? They go in, they don't leave. The, the Indian in India that bound down to Buddha every 10 minutes, he doesn't leave. The dogs, the lions, the zebra, the rats, the worms, the eagles, they're not alive. Everybody's alive and they don't listen to the laws. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the conclusion. Put it in your head and never let it go out. According to your Creator and my Creator, Creator of everything here, according to the Creator of the soul and the life of eternity and life after life and everything you know and aware of and what you're not aware of, life is not what you thought until today. Just to talk and to walk and to smile and to dance in a club and to eat whatever you see, you are considered dead 100% in the eyes of God. For God, which Jew is alive, a Jew that is close to him every second. He listens to him, he thinks about him, he thanks him, he prays to him, he eats, he says thank you. He wants to cheat, he remembers God told me not to. He wants to be not such a good husband and to be aggressive with his wife, but then he thinks, but God is watching me and God told me that I must be nice to her. So every second of his life, and even when he makes mistakes, Wow, how did I make a mistake? Please forgive me, God. I hope it will never happen. Give me another chance. So that means it's, co it's connected to God. To be connected to Hashem means to listen to Him. That's the first thing. Every time God speaks about the word life in Hebrew, Chaim, life, He never ever spoke about the temporary life that we have over here. Only eternal life. 
For God there's no temporary life, there's no such concept. It's either eternal life or eternal death, and no in between. Life over here, the dogs also have. The monkeys in the safari, they also live 30, 40 years. That's not life. As soon as the person is born, he begins to die. Hashem says like this, you know what kills me? This is Hashem speaking now. That you left me, the source of the ocean, all the water, 72% of the world is the oceans and the river, massive amount of waters. I am the ocean. I, I can, I gave you myself for free. You left me, you neglected me to dig lousy holes in your backyard, maybe you're gonna get a drop of water. You understand the, the parable here? The analogy? I am the real God who made the world and gave you life of eternity. If you follow some of my instructions and you pass the test, and what are you doing? You replaced me with any lousy nonsense out there. As long as you're not gonna have to do anything with me. This is what it says, Oti Asvu. They left me, I'm the source of all the water. Maybe they can find few drops of water by, by digging holes in the ground. This is the analogy. Scary. So let's, before you grinding water and wasting all your life, I'm sure none of you want to leave every second in a mistake. None of you. I, I don't believe that anybody here wants to live seven years in a life. And in the end comes in front of God to a trial. Why we say Kaddish on uh, deceased people for one year? Because the trial is one year. The Torah say one year trial. Every sentence came out of your mouth, you're gonna see in your trial. With the scenario, with the people, with the, everything that happened. All your lies, all your cheating, all your stealing. Whatever you did in hidden rooms, cannot hide. It's very interesting. The Torah says that in the next life, the main punishment of the person is the shame. The embarrassment. That's before talking about hell and all the other punishments, God forbid. Before even getting into it. Your Creator supply you with oxygen, with health. Ability to walk, to talk, to see, to, to enjoy taste. Billions of miracles happen in your body every second for 78 years. He does a lot for you. You have a house, a bed to sleep, a car to drive, a phone to talk, to do things. Everything you have, basically it's from him. Why? If he decides, God forbid, that you won't have it, in one second you lose everything. He can walk a million years and save a trillion dollars if he closed your nostril for 30 seconds, that's it, it's the end of the story. So obviously every second you, lay, uh, you leave, everything you do in your life, he gives it to you. And what do you do with what he gives you? Use it against him. There's an eye who watch over you. Ayn ro'a ve'ozen shomad ve'chol ma'asecha ba'sefer nikhtavim. There's an eye who watch over you, there's a ear who listens to you and everything you do is being registered in the book of God. You cannot delete. It's not emails. Delete history. Over there the history is strong in front of your eyes. Ignorance is the biggest danger to a life of a person in any field. Nevertheless, in the most important thing, the purpose of his life. Person will live here seven years and not touch the purpose why God put him here. Isn't it such a major disappointment like this? You come in front of God and say seven years of your life was a waste of time. Not one minute of your life you are connected to me. Not one minute of your life you did what I put you here to put. You did not gain anything, you did not achieve anything, you destroyed my world and now there's a huge list of sins that you make and I have to judge you for each one of them. Does it make sense that a person would live in this place 60, 70, 90 years, whatever it is, and every second of his life is going to go against his Creator? How can it be? The answer is nobody uses his head. If a person begins to put away all his nonsense, 
all his illusions and focus on the real target in life, he will hide under the, the table from the embarrassment. Watching one day of his life, he won't know where to hide. When he sees that every step he makes in his life, it's a sin against his God. When I watch you 70 years, every second of your life, not once you were embarrassment to do what you do, eating pork, eating without bracha, stealing in a business, cheating, smoking on Shabbat, doing all the things you do, multiply by seven years, not once you felt a knife going into your heart. It's all illusion, illusion, illusion. You cannot ever become happy by rebelling against your Creator. You can never gain anything. It's all a test. Living 70 years in a life, and then God, one day we're all going to die, and finding out then, in the final stop, that you went to the wrong direction, that's going to be a major, major disappointment. Why are we going to go blinded against God? Why? We're only going to lose. The Torah says, Haomer echta ve'ashuv, echta ve'ashuv, en maspikim be'yado. Someone who knows the truth, and say, one day I'll be religious. One day, Rabbi, not today. Now I'm in the middle of business, it's very hard, I'm not going to be able to keep Shabbat, I have to be in a store, all kinds of stories. So somebody like this may be really planning to be religious in a few years. When the time comes, and he would like to start, it will be a hundred times harder. Why? Because he puts God down. God is nothing for him, like a job. I know the truth today when I'm 25. When I'll be 70, 60, I'll have time for you. Yes? When you would want to repent, I will make it impossible for you. No help. Now you know the truth. You do it right away. I understand from you that if you would do it, if you would know it 10 years ago, then you would become righteous 10 years ago. The fact that you're 25 and you just came to the lecture here tonight and you saw the truth, now is your main test in life what you're going to do in the next hour. Why? You have to understand. Everything that you do in your life without Hashem, you wouldn't be able to move a finger. Even to bang a nail on the wall, you have to ask Hashem, help me that it will go right. That it won't go crooked and you're not going to break your finger. We taking everything for granted. You get saved a hundred times a month from an accident in a car, you didn't pay attention. You picked up your head in the last minute, you pressed the brake, the police didn't see you. All kinds of miracles. Ah, we got used to it. We take everything for granted. 12 times the Torah says, more than anything else, I made the seventh day in a creation holy, as a covenant, as eternal covenants between me and the nation of Israel for eternity. You want to be my son? You want to be my faithful son, my loyal son? You want to show that you're with me? What's the foundation of everything? The Sabbath. The nation of Israel observed the Sabbath. To make Shabbat for eternity, an eternal covenant. Eternal, not temporary. Between me, Beni Uven Bnei Israel, between me and the nation of Israel, Ot Ile Olam, it's a sign forever that I made the world in six days and in the seventh day I rested. What comes right after? What comes right after that? Mechaleleha Mot Yumat. Someone who will dare to make the Sabbath a weekday and to work and to create father and all the other things that some of us do. What comes after that is a billion times worse. People don't pay attention. Venichreta anefesh aim Israel. I am going to cut 
God forbid, I'm getting goosebumps all over my body after I said 5,000 times already. It never stopped because it's shocking. People are ignorant, they don't know what they're doing. Ignorance, not knowing the rule, doesn't change reality. What comes right after that? I am going to cut that soul of this Mechalel Shabbat out of my nation for eternity. He has no part of the world to come. Billions of years of loss for shopping five minutes a day on Shabbat or watching a stupid baseball game or cooking a soup. When today you can do everything without violating Shabbat. Soup you can cook from before. You put it on the fire. You eat hot soup, we eat hot soup, chulen, cold, cold cut, rice, hot bread, salads. We eat five stars restaurant. No limitation whatsoever today with today's technology. Lights on and off as much as we want. Taking go to the park, going with the children, playing in the backyard, sleeping, eating, learning, enjoying, bringing guests, singing, and in earning eternity. And the other hand, what's the other option? Losing everything. Why? The foundation of, of the covenant. The people don't understand what does it mean, covenant. Covenant means an eternal agreement. Now you are holding to it, trying to build towers and mansions and buildings and vacations. Before you set up all this pleasure, you don't even get, you're not even going to enjoy it. It's going to be over before it starts and you're going to sit and regret for eternity. For the opportunity that I gave you to earn spiritual eternal pleasure, you sold it for nothing, for some delicious food for a vacation, for driving on Shabbat to the supermarket. For that you sold me, there's not gonna be an end to the pain that we're going to have. Only when you realize, for your stupid things, for your ignorance, what price you're going to pay, that's when you're going to feel the pain. That pleasure that I'm promising you in this book, which is signed personal guarantee by me, not by a Congress member. When I sign, I keep my word. What is it? I will benefit you, I will reward you in such a way that no matter how you try to imagine this pleasure, you can never understand how great it's going to be. I'm sure you ask yourself many times, how is it possible that the rabbi hardly pays bills? Even to afford a car, sometimes he cannot. And this guy that doesn't keep Shabbat, doesn't put filling, marry a non-Jewish lady, eats not kosher, cheat in a business, all his life is a life from A to Z, makes millions. What's going on here? Where is the justice of God? We see the Torah, we know, we read, but we don't see reality. Reality is the opposite. Is it really the case? No, it's not the case. I am paying my haters, my enemies, cash to their face to get rid of them. Here, again, I repeat. Paying my enemies, my haters, cash to their face to get rid of them. I will not delay the payment to the wicked people. So I don't understand. If they're wicked, what payment? Why you pay them cash? For what? The answer is, even the most wicked Jew in the world made some mitzvot in his life. Once a year he fasted on Yom Kippur. Once in a life he put a dollar here and there in a box. Once every two years he put filin. Sometimes he eat kosher accidentally. Didn't know. It was kosher. Yeah? Or once somebody told him, make a mitzvah, sit in a sukkah, make a mitzvah. Once in his life he washed his hand before he ate bread. It could be, no? Accidentally he does mitzvot here and there. So God owes him for this mitzvot. He's the God of justice. He said, Ani el haemet ve'atzedek. I am the God of the truth of the justice. Not a judge in the Israeli court. I am the real God, the real justice. No! Phony business here, 100% precise like the law. So if you made some mitzvot, even though you're wicked, 95% sins, 5% mitzvot, 
I gotta pay you for the five percent. But I don't want, I don't want you in the world of eternity that I promised to the righteous Jews. I don't want you to enter there. So I'm paying you cash in this life to get rid of you. No rabbis, no translation, no books that were written five years ago. Clearly from the text of the Torah, paying the wicked Jews cash to their face to get rid of them. So if he has a Mercedes, if he has a $10 million house, if he owns a baseball team, if his wife is the most beautiful girl in, in town or whatever the case is, or all his dream came through, feel very bad for the guy. It's moment before eternal, final spiritual destruction. Before it's over. He gets paid before it's over. You want your reward in this life. You lose everything. You will see what you lose, you will never agree. People think they don't understand what they eat. Every piece of leather, 100 worms inside, crawling. You cannot see them. You take a magnifying glass, look at the leather, see how they move. How many worms you eat every day, you'll be crazy. That's, by the way, one of the reasons you cannot get close to God, because if you eat non-kosher food, it creates a filthy blood, spiritually. Not physically. Physically, it's the same blood. Spiritually, it's against the law of the Creator. It's like pulling the wrong gasoline in your Mercedes. It won't drive good. It's not that it's not a good car. It's not, dri it's not driving good because the gasoline is not good. It's full of dirt and mud and mixed with water. I don't know. So, eating not kosher, Rashi writes, make you dumb. Not dumb that you don't know math. You can be a genius in math and in computers. You can be all A student. No. Be dumb. Metumtam in a, in a holy language means cannot tell the difference between a sin and a mitzvah. Cannot tell the difference. So finally, if somebody comes to him and say, give me donation. When I come and tell him, give donation to make DVDs, we save souls. It's only a dollar each. He gives me $20. The guy from the Reform Shul is gonna come with his boyfriend Hag, the Rebbe, is gonna come and he's gonna say, give me a million dollars to make a party. Boys, girls in a shul in front of the Sefer Torah, hugging, kissing, coming all naked in the house of God. He's gonna give him a million dollars. Why? Because he eats not kosher food. He cannot tell the difference between mitzvah and a sin. I'm not saying it to offend anybody. Don't get the wrong idea. And I'm not talking to you like I'm anything greater than you. I'm just saying what the Torah says. And each one of us, with no exception, have to hear and force ourselves to do the right thing. Each one of us has weaknesses, you know. One guy does this bad and the other thing bad and some does better. Each one of us needs to improve. Some of us, unfortunately, don't do anything. It's about time to wake up. How do you wake up? Tonight, before you go to sleep, you speak to God, say, dear God, I'm your son. Finally, I went to a lecture. I saw that your Torah is really real. You're watching me all the time. I'm very, I'm very embarrassed for what I did all my life. Please forgive me. Give me an opportunity to correct. I know that the Torah said that if somebody makes tshuva, you forgive all his sins. So help me. I don't know where to start. I grew up like a goy. My parents put me in a goyish education. My friends are goyim on the street. I do not know even to read Hebrew. I don't know anything. But I don't want to die like a goy and lose my share to the world to come. Please help me out. Give me the right rabbis, direct me to the right lectures in the website, direct me to the right local lectures, get me to the right books, introduce the right people to me. Help me to overcome my desires. That's the most important thing. I can't stop eating this. I cannot stop with my girlfriend. I cannot stop with this. I cannot stop rebelling against my parents. Everyone with these problems. Talk to Hashem. In three months, you begin to see one miracle after the other. The nature of the person is, he's not willing to change his lifestyle unless, if he's convinced 100% that his lifestyle is a lie, it's against the purpose of life, it's against the purpose that's why he was created for, 
his creator created him for one purpose. Since he does not, is not aware of the, of the purpose, he's dealing with other things, he's wasting his time. So if a person is convinced that I was created by the creator of the world and he gave me a purpose, and I don't even know what's my purpose, obviously I'm not fulfilling my mission in life. So when a person begins to realize that this is a book that God gave me, obviously he has to be very clever and read the book very carefully. And once he sees this is the words of his creator, is willing to listen to him because it's not the professor in college or the or the, che the teacher in school that tells you what to do with him you can play games but if you know that your life is in the hand of your creator and he promised you after you leave this planet a life of eternity if you pass his test and you earn what you're supposed to earn or god forbid a life of destruction if you fail in your mission you gotta be a fool to ignore it excuse my language but that's the way i feel so yeah, you have two options here. One is to stick to the truth, investigate and search for it, and slowly, slowly, obviously, you see that your way leads you to destruction. It's better to wake up before it's too late. Or to continue in your lifestyle and ignore reality. But you know, when you ignore reality, those who are smoking cigarettes, they already ignoring reality. They know they shorten their life seven minutes every time they smoke a cigarette. That's what the scientists prove. So they continue to ignore reality. Those who eat very non-healthy food, they ignore reality. Those who do other things in life, in the life, in the family, they ignore reality. The destruction comes later on. If you want to choose this way, it's your choice. But one thing for sure, you want to know, you want to investigate. If you find one mistake in the Torah, one, you're free to do whatever you want. That's going to be your proof that it's not a divine book. So far, for those who didn't know, 3,319 years. Millions of genius people, philosophers, Jews and non-Jews, were searching for that mistake. Not once somebody pointed at one error in the Torah. You bring me the New Testament, I show you error in every chapter. If you don't believe me, watch my debate with a Christian priest, the professor, also in my website, and you see how many errors in a book that two billion people follow strictly. Christianity. That a person like me and you wrote, full of errors. Do you want to be like them? It's your choice. Or, you, or we, the only nation that received the book from the creator of the world, Torah, means instruction. Do we want to ignore what we have in our shelf? Or it's about time to reclean it from the dust and begin to learn what's, what's we doing in this life. The Torah said that Hashem said, you have to fear me. Remember, there's an eye who watch you. I'm recording you all the time. Recording you. Sometimes you see a dog, you embarrass to make a scene near the dog. When you die, you come in front of God, he's going to show you that. And he's going to ask you, I'm worse than a dog? In front of the dog, you are embarrassed. But in front of me, you don't care. You can care less about me. I'm giving you oxygen, you breathe, and you use it against me. I'm giving you food, you take it, you use it against me. I'm giving you a mouth, you use it against me. I give you hands, you're doing scenes. I give you legs, you're going to places you're not supposed to. Only one thing can save us he is making repentance, which means tshuva. The Torah says, you return from all your sins against me and correct it. And then, only then, I will start having mercy on you and begin to forgive your sins. If the wicked Jew, which means he doesn't listen to Hashem, will make tshuva, will make repentance, and slowly, slowly come back to the right way, Everything he said will be forgotten. Everything he did, all the bad he did will be erased. This is an opportunity to erase everything, but we don't know when we die. Maybe tomorrow, how do we know? Right now, before tomorrow, it may be too late. The Torah say, open me the size of a needle. Very small hole, open your, open your window. And I open you the size of the whole world.
So now comes the Torah and say, I have a special great deal for you. At any given time, as long as you're still alive, you can make a switch. What is it? You stop with your sins immediately. You regret everything you did. The first Yom Kippur that comes, you fast and cry and ask for forgiveness. And from this moment on, you keep all my laws, all my laws, and I will forgive all your sins. The Torah say, the Torah is a piece of cake to keep, just like this. It's not beyond the ocean. It's not above heaven. It's right in your hand to keep. It's very easy. And God said, I wish they will be clever to fear and respect me in the right prospect that I should reward them as I promised. So you say, you can make repentance, true? If you don't do it now, maybe tomorrow you'll never have another chance. And if you will have, it's going to be a lot harder. Plus, Let's say you will make repentance in 10 years from now. Possible. Nobody will ever be able to return to you this valuable 10 years that you wasted. Two, you may be able then, if you make very strong and serious repentance, tshuva, to erase all your sins. Torah says, I'm not God, I didn't make the laws. God is willing to erase everything if you make real repentance. One thing you will never be able to get the 10 years that you could have earned billions of mitzvot those billions of mitzvot that you lost is gone what was lost is lost yes I made repentance but you lost 10 years of keeping Shabbat 10 years it's 520 Shabbatot each Shabbat is an unbelievable reward no you'll never get it it's, it's gone you, can, you lost another million blessing. Everything you had, you could have made blessing. You don't have it now. It's like retiring age 20. From 20 to 30, you stay at home, you didn't work. Yes, it's true. Age 30, you can start making money and maybe even a lot of money. Nobody will return you the 10 years that you can make millions. You understand? God will erase your debt on your credit cards, whatever you owe him but you're not gonna get the 10 years potentially what you could have made. So why to be a fool? Let's wake up today. The Torah say you either win big time or you lose big time. Don't ever forget this. Again, you either win big time, you don't win, you lose big time. And it's very painful, don't ever forget that. That's why everyone must investigate. And once you know the Torah is divine, you cannot ignore it. If you're smart, nobody wants horrible future. Everyone do everything they can to set their future to become better. For their children, for their marriage, for their house, for their career, for pension, for, uh, you know, one day they want to retire. Nobody is doing everything he can to ruin his future. Everyone is dreaming about a better future. Why would a person destroy his eternity just because he's lazy to investigate one or two days of his life if the Torah is the book of God? Because remember, once you know it's the book of God, you have a very precious diamond in your hand, my friend. Just walk a little bit. It's going to be yours for good. The Torah says something tremendous. You should know that a person doesn't live only by food, by bread. No. Not only thanks to the food you alive. You have to live and the life, the gasoline for your life is the Torah, the words of God. Not only food, food the dogs also have. The dogs eat. The non jews also eat. They don't have the Torah. They eat, they do whatever they want. They take drugs, they, they, they make all kinds of crimes. They don't care. They also alive. They play guitar. They are very good basketball players. Is this life? The answer is no, baloney. That's not life. 
that's an illusion. So why they don't die? Because if everybody who go against the Creator will get punished immediately, there's no free choice. The free choice get eliminated right away. Of course, if you just kill somebody, you get shot. If you just rob the bank, you get robbed in your house. If you punch a person, somebody just came a second later and punched you. If you get tzedakah, you may double two minutes later. Everybody will be a robot. Look at this rabbi. I put a hundred dollars in a box. I turn around, two hundred on the floor. I put the two hundred in, I turn around, four hundred on the floor. Oh, what's the point? I'm doubling my money every second. You don't deserve reward. That's not a test. If you just punch somebody and a second later somebody punched you. You punch him tomorrow, somebody has punched you. The next day you punch somebody, somebody has punched you. Where is the test? You're never gonna punch anyone. You hate him, you wanna kill him, you don't move. Why? <laughs> Who wants to get a punch? The test is that the Torah say, this is what you're going to get. And you're doing it, and you're not getting it. Oh, what happened to God? He forgot? God told Adam, the day you eat from the tree, you're going to die. When did he die, really? 930 <coughs> years later. God has patience. 930 years later, almost a thousand years later, he only died. It's all a test. The same way a father is strict with his son, this is how your God is strict with you. Be careful not to forget the day that you receive these laws from me. Don't forget, you're gonna end up loose. Don't forget, if you remember and follow it, you win. If you ignore it and you forget it, you lose big time. If the Torah told you when a person dies wicked, he goes to a worse place than Auschwitz, worse. Why do you think God is a liar? Because you want to feel good? And then later you're gonna find out where you're going? The idea is to be clever. Why will I live 70 years and then every minute of my life I'm accumulating more and more sins that in the end I'm gonna have to pay for each one. There's no discounts, why? Why can't I be righteous? Why can I keep Shabbos? If I'm a woman, why can't I not dress modest? What's the big deal to dress modest like a human being, not walking around naked on the street? What's the big deal to eat kosher meat, to pay an extra two, three dollars a pound? That's what's going to kill us in our life. Once you see this book is divine, Every word is divine. Every letter is divine and eternal and have a massive impact on our life if we're going to listen or not. I am going to benefit you for thousand generations. How? I only live one generation. Here, the elf door, a thousand generations. You're going to be rewarded. When a wicked person makes repentance from all his sins, he would live in this life and in the next life he will never die. consider a lover of God. I'm sure all of you want to be in this category, I have no doubt. But many of you are not in this category. The truth must be said loud. I myself don't think I'm in this category. With no, you know, discrimination here. My opinion that I still have a long way to get there. But each one according to his understanding where you rate yourself. The more you learn, you know that you have to do a lot more. But as well Hashem, one day I'll get there. But in general, who is a lover of Hashem? Someone who keep all his mitzvot. The Torah say that the reward for the mitzvot in the, is not in this world. It's impossible to pay the Jews reward for the mitzvot that they do in this world, in this temporary physical world. All the reward is waiting for the world of eternity. I'm not talking about the punishment. Just how much reward you lose. Forget punishment. Let's say there's no punishment at all. 
When they put you inside a room full of diamonds, five minutes and you smoke your cigar and you come out empty pocket, can be a, a, a bigger fool than you. Hey, where is the diamonds? We gave you five minutes free access to the diamonds. Yeah, but you know, the cigar is a Cuban cigar. Years I couldn't get it. Embargo, you know, Castro, you know, they don't let. Finally, I had a Cuban cigar over there. I had a nice, beautiful lady, she smiled to me. So I said, how are you doing? What do you do? I was busy. That's us. That's us. Hashem put us here 60, 40, 50, 70 years. What do we do? Wasting time. Wasting time. The only book from 80,000 religions and cults that started after Judaism started, the only book that is full of prophecies, hundreds of prophecies, it's the Torah. The Torah says that before Mashiach will come, there's going to be a huge war in the world. It's called Gog and Magog. A very serious war. 250 years ago, the Vilna Gaon, the Vilna Gaon in Vilna, he told his students that the last war will end in a period of nine minutes. The entire world will be destroyed in nine minutes. Everybody laughed. Because in his generation, they just invented a gun. And how, how was the first gun? You have a powder. You gotta put some powder inside. You move it and you shoot one bullet. Then you have to clean it. You put some powder, you shoot another bullet. In a generation like this, how exactly you destroy the world in nine minutes? Today, I don't have to explain you how you destroy the world in nine minutes, right? Five, six atomic missiles bombs from one country to the other, everything is collapsed. The book of Zachary 14. In the prophets, one of them, his name was Zechariah. He described the last war. The last war over there in Zechariah, there's no doubt that he's speaking about an atomic war. No doubt. Because he described over there that all the nations will go against Israel to attack Jerusalem, all of them. And they will make a revolution in Israel. A horrible thing will happen in the beginning of this war. Many, many people will get killed. The ladies will run all over. They're gonna rape the ladies. Many people will run to the desert, try to hide everywhere they can. But from the moment that God interfered with this war, He's gonna bring on them such a disaster that they're gonna try to help one another, this going, the Gentiles. When they're gonna grab one another, try to get them out, their hands will melt and their eyes will spill out of their holes. What, what does it tell you? How an eyes of a person spill like water? You understand? Plus it described that there will be a complete darkness. Now, it's true that there are many different prophecies. There are few possibilities. Which one of them God will choose as the end of this world, as the end of that until Mashiach will come? We don't know. He never told us. We have few possibilities. Let me tell you the possibility. One possibility was that it's not going to be a war, no problem, nothing. The Jews, all of them, had a chance to make repentance. And God said, you all deserve the Mashiach to come. He comes, nobody suffer, no problem, finished. This time is over, 18 years ago. Now we enter to Acharit Ayamim. Acharit Ayamim in Hebrew means the ends of days. As I told you, the last quarter, from 24 quarters. Acharit Ayamim has to be through some kind of tragedy. What kind of tragedy? This is the way it's going to be. According to the Zohar, to the Kabbalah, 15 days before Mashiach comes, there will be complete darkness in the world. Remember, in Egypt there were days of darkness? It's going to happen again. Nobody will know if it's day or night. Complete darkness, 15 days. How is it going to be? Only God knows. He can do whatever He wants. It's no problem. 15 days of complete darkness. Why God needs complete darkness? In those 15 days, He cleaned the world 
from all the wicked people, Jews and non-Jews. All the non-righteous non non-Jews, the Gentiles, all be clean from the face of the earth. And among them, Jews that did not keep the laws of the Torah. They're all gonna clean from here. After 15 days, the sun will rise, Mashiach will come, and that's gonna be the salvation of the Jewish nation. For those who have doubts, I wanna remind you that it happened exactly the same in Egypt. How many Jews came out of Egypt? Only 20%. 80% of the Jews died with the Egyptians in the plague of the, of the darkness, in Hoshech. In the days of darkness, 80% of the Jews did not have the merit to leave Egypt. Only 20% came out. 20% were few million people. Multiplied by four, that's how many people died in Egypt. How many Jews? Millions. Either way, it's too much. 12 million, it's 80% of the Jewish nation in Egypt. So it happened once in history. Only 20% Hamushim Yatsu Bnei Israel in Mitzrayim, one out of five. So now history may repeat itself. It says 15 days of darkness, and after that, he cleaned the world from, he cleaned the world from all the wicked people. Now you may ask me among the non-Jews, what's considered righteous or not? You'll be surprised. There are non-Jews that are very righteous. All they have to do is keep seven laws. And this is what the Prophet says. That's a different prophecy. We finish with the Zohar, with the Kabbalah. That's another possibility. God says, my anger will reach the record, the highest level. And in my strict word and fire and my anger, I promise that it's going to be a huge noise on the land of Israel. Rash Gadol al Admat Israel, probably it's earthquake. Noise on the ground, what does it mean? Probably earthquake. And this is what it described. And the ocean will rock. And the fish will go crazy, nuts. There'll be panic, the fish. And even the birds in the sky. And all the animals on the mountain and in the valley and all the things that crawl on the floor, the snakes, the worms, and every person that's walking on the ground, everybody will be shocked from what's going to happen that day. And the mountains will collapse, and walls, and buildings, and houses will all fall down. What does it mean? That's we're speaking about Israel. And I'm going to make my final judgment to the people on the ground. With blood, rain of fire, rain of fire. Fire is falling from the sky on all the people, fire. And all the nations that came to attack Israel. And the bottom line, and the last things the Gemara say, ve'en lanu al mi lismoch, ela al avinu shebashamayim. Every Jew before Mashiach come will realize, maybe moments before, maybe months before, I don't know, that we have nobody to count on, not on our money, not on our father-in-law, not on the Americans, not on the Europeans, whatever you want to count on. You're not going to be able to count on them, Everybody will realize, if Hashem won't save me, I'm finished. And then when Mashiach comes. There are 613 commandments, and three of them are restrictions not to disturb the dead people. From the 613, the duck three. Three are dedicated as a warning to the Jews do not call the dead people and ask them questions. What an intelligent person understand right away. If God gave us a book in public in front of millions of people and spoke to Moses and all of us heard it, and inside the book he said, be very careful not to call the dead people and ask them questions, 
Don't I know that I cannot speak to a dead person? I need a Torah to tell me this. So what do we understand from here? That there is a way to communicate with the dead people. Doesn't matter right now, I don't know how. I don't know how. But there is a way to communicate with the dead people. That means they're existing somewhere. They're not dead, like we thought. Three different verses. One, it's called Lo Yimatsebecha. You don't, ha- you should not have among you Shoel of. That's one way. Idoni Udoreshel Ametim. Three different ways to communicate with the dead people. Today we call it seance, medium, more modern words, but it's the same lady with a different dress. So the idea is the same idea, just that the modern, the parapsychologists, they invented all kinds of Latin words for it. But according to the Torah, this is the original expression. God himself was not interested that we will know exactly the day that Mashiach will come. He never told us a specific day. More than that, in Israel, or all over the world, people are communicating with the dead people through what we call in America Ouija board, seance. They put a cup, they light candles, and they begin to call dead people. And the glass begins to move. They put their finger in the air like this, and the glass begins to move, and it gives answer. I'm sure you heard about it. Every time Israelis ask when Mashiach will come, Something unbelievable happened. The glass exploded. No permission to say. Uva Lezion Goel Uleshave Pesha Beyakov. The Savior is coming to Zion. Zion is Israel. The Savior, the Mashiach. He's coming to Israel. To who? To who is coming? To who the Mashiach is coming? Leshave Pesha Beyakov. Those who return back from their sins make repentance. They will have the merit to see the face of Mashiach. Those who continue to steal, those who continue to drive on Shabbat, those who continue to make sex crimes, those who speak Lashonara every day, those who don't come to shul to pray, and many other sins that it's not the time to mention, they will not see it. They will not have the merit. This is what God called to every Jew to do. Shuva Israel, Ad Hashem Elokecha, Ki Kashalta Ba'avonecha. Listen Israel, it's time to return from all your sins. Because you fail with all these sins that you made. Collect all the things, the good things that you can collect. And return to me. Return to God. Tell Him. Take the good. And So we'll pay with our lips. What does it mean? We'll pray. We pray, we read Tehillim. Maybe you accept our repentance. Mi chacham ve'yaven ele Who is a smart person that should understand it? And a wise person that should know that the ways of God is always straight. The righteous will walk through it and the criminals, the wicked, will fail in it. The wicked, he wants to go drink coffee with his non-Jewish girlfriend in a, in a, in a club in Manhattan. I don't want to tell you what they do over there also. Why? Because he doesn't know the purpose of life. Not that he's an evil person. I'm sure he's not. Those who understand that once Mashiach comes, that's it. You don't accept converts anymore. All the non-Jews that will see that, they will run, they scream, we want to be Jewish, no, please accept us. It will be too late for them. Those who did it before, they're lucky. Those who will try to do it after, it's too late for them. Why? There's no, uh, everything, no free choice, no test. Of course, everybody wants to jump to get the diamonds right now, right? Plus, Baalei Tshuva, Jews that will say, okay, okay, let me correct my sins. It's too late. Too late. Ignorance 
is a very dangerous thing. In everything, not only in Judaism, but in Judaism it's critical because it's for eternity. If you don't know computer, you suffer 20 years. You spend hours every day because you don't know how to do things in two seconds. You don't know, you never learn, so you do it in a primitive way. Or you use a primitive computer. So how many years you suffer? 20 years in your work. You work every day extra two hours. No, fine, you live with that. If you don't eat healthy, you sick here, you sick there, you have allergies, you have all kinds of sicknesses. No, it's not the end of the world. But if you go against God and you fail in your test in life, the outcome is tremendous. You understand? That's what people don't understand. And I always beg people, wake up. You don't realize, you don't believe, come and learn. Come and argue. Bring your own proofs against the Torah. No problem. I'll be the first one to come with you to eat McDonald's and Yom Kippur and I pay the bill if you show me one mistake in the Torah. You feel, after many years you deal with people, you feel right away that the soul is a very good and high soul. And you feel such disappointment that these people were raised in such a phony lifestyle. And their parents, unfortunately, did not give them Jewish education and they don't even know the purpose of life. They think that life is to go to college, to have degrees, to get married and to make a lot of money, to go to vacations, to wear nice clothes, trips, a lot of jewelry, makeup, this, and that's life. You have it, you're successful. You don't have it, too bad. <laughs> that's not what life is all about. God gave you life not for this nonsense. Don't be fooled by what you see around you. Millions of people live in a dream, live in a lie. Ask a person on the street, ask anyone, even smart, even educated, even the richest people in the world. Tell me, can you write to me the purpose of life from A to Z? Why our Creator put us here? What are we supposed to do? What's the truth? What's going to be after life? Do you, can you swear that your life is in the right direction? None of them even know what you want from them. They think you're crazy. Maybe you think I'm crazy now when I tell you this. But I promise you, I'm not. If you think I'm crazy, check yourself first. Now it's a moment of eternity. Now it's a very serious intersection in your life. It's not a joke. If you make the right turn now, the right turn, you go into the website, tomorrow another lecture, and tomorrow another lecture, and tomorrow another lecture, within a month you'll be a rabbi. Piece of cake, with love, passion, fire inside your soul, inside your heart. I know from experience, I have thousands like this, thousands. Every day I get more than a hundred emails, every day. People I never saw their face become fully religious just from listening to the lectures on the website out from this DVD. If you ignore what you saw tomorrow, you go back on your routine, that's it. The next time maybe you'll have another chance in five years from now, it will be a lot harder from today. Why every time you had an opportunity to come to God and He reached His arm to you and you pushed it away, the next time you'll have less Siyata Dishmaya. Less help until the Rambam, Maimonides, he writes in the law of repentance, the biggest punishment to a Jew is that Hashem is closing the gate of repentance in his face and he cannot enter. Obviously, don't get me wrong, everyone can make repentance, but every chance will become a lot harder than the previous one. And that's what I just read to you before. Return now, not tomorrow. Ha'omer echta ve'ashuv. Echta ve'ashuv. En maspikim be'yado. Someone who say, I'm gonna make sins today. Tomorrow I'll make repentance. I'm gonna make sins today. Tomorrow I'm gonna make repentance. He will not have a chance to make repentance. This is the word of God. Another place the Torah says, don't say, don't dare to say, Rabbi, I will come one day to learn Torah. Right now I'm busy. I'm building my career. I'm busy in college. 
I just opened a business with my father. Everyone has excuses. I'm just freshly married. You know, I have to... Excuses. Today, God had mercy on us. He see the low level that we live in, spiritually. So he gave us the internet. The internet can destroy you, but internet can make your life every second a mitzvah. Depend what you use, do with this. That's it. Now you have it. You're young. All of you in the 20s you can have 50 years of success. Once you leave this world, eternity of pleasure. Remember all the pleasure in this world combined of all the generations of all the people. It's not equal to one hour of the reward. You want to lose it? For what? For watching television? For what? For eating? The pizza tastes the same. Here it's kosher, here it's not. Don't be a fool. The steak tastes the same. Yeah, you pay maybe 10%, 20% more, 30% more. Don't worry, Hashem anyway is giving you the money. Money doesn't come from you. It's feeding everyone anyway. It's all a test. I'm testing you to see what's in your heart. Are you going to keep my mitzvot or not? That I should reward you in your end. Clear word in the Torah, clear sentence. That I should reward you in your end. <laughs> Please don't be fooled to lose this reward. I'm begging you for you. Once you do it, you'll be the happiest person because God knows better for you what's good for you than you think. You think I'm going to do this, I'm going to go, I'm going to be a lawyer, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be a businessman, I'm going to be a drug dealer, whatever you want to think. God knows what's better for you. You listen to him, you can never lose. You listen to yourself or to society, you lose here and for sure you lose there. And over there the pain is tremendous. We have all the time in a month. We should be ashamed of ourselves. Not once in our life we open the Torah and pray and say thank you to Hashem. Everything we take for granted. What? Everybody has children. You're wrong. 15% of the Jews don't have children. And they pay fortune and years of suffering until maybe they'll become pregnant. Everyone is married. You're wrong. It's an epidemic. Hundreds of thousands of Jews older than 35, 40 are not married all over the world, in Europe, in America, in Israel. And they ask, why? Why? Why nobody can get married? Look how many people are single already. They should have been grandparents already and they never got married. You know why? The Torah say why. They go to clubs every Friday night. Shabbat, they go to the beach with all the naked ladies. Every day they see things that Hashem said, be careful not to see. They don't appreciate marriage. Why should they get married? They abuse their wife and cheat on her by seeing all these people. Why for? I'm doing you a favor. I'm leaving you single. People think that Hashem is a clown. He's going to dance according to my music. Hashem, I need a new wife. Okay, right away. Hey, Hashem, I need a new million dollars. Right away, on the way. Doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. And this is the last sentence for today. Kine Yotzer Arim. Here he is the creator of the huge mountain. Uvore Ruach. And making the winds blow. Umagid Adam Masecho. The same one will tell the person after he leave this world. Every word that came out of his mouth, he will show him when he said it, what did he say, what time, what day, to who, if it was good, if it was bad, that's called Magid La Adam Asicho. Rashi writes, this is the prophet Amos. Rafi writes, Rashi writes, Kol maasav portim lefanav bishat mitato. Every step you made in your life, yeah, it will be analyzed together with God if you did it positively or negatively. The master of universe, his name is God.
I want to tell you one thing. If it's enough for me, after two hours that I spoke, that you remember only one thing. You remember there's a book in your house that probably you never open and read Hebrew, English, Russian, Persian, doesn't matter, it's the same words. You probably never read, you never learn, and there is somebody that told you tonight that it's the word of your Creator. And also one more thing you should remember. The rule to this, applied to this, to this book is like this. You follow it, the more you follow it, the more happy you're gonna be for eternity. The more you ignore it, the more miserable you'll be for eternity, not for 30, 40 years, which is a blink of the eye. Before you realize, life will be over. There are two ways, and your choice is in your hand. The Torah says, I'm giving you the life and the good today, the bad and the dead, and you should choose the life. That means you can choose the dead, but you don't die immediately. It can take 40, 50 years until it happens. Once it's happened, it's no way to correct. And the Gemara concludes, the righteous Jews sit with a crown to their head. It's an analogy. We don't have an understanding in a spiritual world because we are physical. No understanding, what does it mean? But one thing we do understand, you will see in a minute. This is what it says. The righteous Jews are sitting with a crown to their head and enjoying the greatness of God. You know what does it mean, Ziv? It's like you have honey dripping from a fruit and you open your mouth and it drips right into your mouth, sweet, great, delicious honey from the dates or something like this. This is an analogy, a spiritual pleasure that we will never understand here. But what do I need to understand? What, I cannot rely on God's promise? If God told me, I am faithful to reward you, Right away, as an intelligent human being, I don't even need a Gemara. Right away I know who should I rely on. On my boss? My father-in-law? Who should I rely on? All the promises that I held in my life and I believe? Oh, my Creator. Who is more faithful? Which reward is going to be sweeter? Which reward is going to be longer? Of course it is. Be careful that you should not forget your God. Because your God is a strict God. It's not a joke here. If he go, if he'll get angry at you, he will destroy you from the face of the earth. Do not test your God as you did before. You should do the honest and the decent in the eyes of God for your own benefits. You're not doing me any favor. I'm perfect with or without you. I'm perfect before I created the world, before I created the souls, before I put you in a test, before I gave you the Torah. I'm perfect. I will be perfect after you. Whatever you do doesn't make any change by me. I'm always perfect. I gave you a way to earn life of eternity with pleasure. And what do you do? You're selling it for pennies. We see that this world is not the place of receiving the reward, the pleasure. That Hashem wanted to benefit the souls. Right? And the place of this Tova, it's in the afterlife, the Olam Abba. But this place is a prosdor, it's a preparation. This is the word of Chazal, preparation for the actual real world. That's where Hashem will benefit the soul. And then he answered the famous question, in that case, why Hashem did not put the soul there right away? Why, why not saving us all this agony and suffering in this world? Just put us where we're supposed to enjoy and that's it. What do we need all this uh, world for? If anything good over here, you have it there. And what's bad over here, you don't have it over there. So why we need to be here? So the answer is, like the gentleman said before, Nama de Kisufa. A person cannot enjoy if he receives bread of shame. When you earn it, you enjoy it. 
you didn't earn it, you don't enjoy it. If you come to live by me, and I give you everything you want, just name it, you get it. Car, money, food, laundry, we do for you everything. After a week, you volunteer to do dirty jobs. Take the garbage out, let me help you cut the grass, uh, whatever you need. You need shopping, let me do. Most people don't like to deal with garbage. Comes with a suit, say here, take the garbages. Not so happy about it. Why volunteer to take the garbage? Because he feel that the more he gets from me, the more he suffer. Not only he doesn't enjoy, the suffering is constantly growing. So we see the nature of the neshama, that a person gets to a point that after that he cannot enjoy anymore unless if he deserves to get it. We see it's a, it's a reality, you cannot deny it. Jews and non-Jews, everyone is like this. To some people they take longer, to some people not as long. Bottom line, everyone gets to that point that from now on he has to contribute. If not, he doesn't want to receive anymore. After all that, why did Hashem make the neshama with such traits? If the purpose of creating the neshama was mekor atov retzono le'ati, the source of good wants to share his great greatness with others. And if there's no one to benefit, what's, what's the point of having all this greatness without sharing it to anyone? Hashem wanted to benefit someone. Therefore, He created the Neshamos and He prepared a place of this reward. And here we have to earn. Why we have to earn? That we will enjoy the greatness. So I ask, why do we need all this? In order for me to enjoy it, you want me to earn it. Why? Because if I won't earn it, I won't enjoy it. Everything Hashem created, He created Yesh Me'ayin. There was nothing. And now there is something. There was no rocks. Now Hashem made the world. There's rocks, there's aluminum, there's gold, there's diamonds, there's water, there's galaxies, stars, trees. Everything you see, there was nothing. Now there is. The Neshama is different. Even though Hashem created also the Neshama, <coughs> but a part of the Neshama is Chelek Eloha Mimal. For those who read a little bit Kabbalah, there's a deep explanation that there's a part of the Neshama. The Neshama has five parts. One part of the Neshama, not the entire Neshama. Some of the Neshama, it is a creation. The Nefesh, the Ruach, yes. But some of the Neshama, there is mamash, an integral, chelek Eloah mimal. Hashem took a spark from himself, it's hard to understand how can it be, and he put it in Adam's body. That part is mamash 100% Hashem, divine, it's a divine thing. And the Torah says, Ani Hashem lo shaniti, there's no way to change me. Something perfect, there's no way to change it. If there is a way to change it, that means it wasn't perfect before. There's no way. So I put a part of myself inside of you. And who am I? I have this midot. This is me. And once you're in, the way I feel, the way I operate, this is the way you're gonna be. There's no way to change you. That's why then the, 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 the neshama, that part of the neshama can never enjoy receiving unless if you, because it's a part of justice. Ani el ha'emet ve'atzedek. When is justice? Justice is when someone earns and he gets. I just have my plan. First I get married, before I have my first son, will become Shomer Shabbos. What did God say in the Torah? Don't make conditions with me. I'm not your friend. I'm your father, I'm your creator. I order you A, B, C, D. Don't tell me, give me a wife, I'll be religious. Give me 10 million dollars, I'll be religious. Make me healthy, I'll be religious. Make my parents come back tomorrow, then I'm willing to consider. I'm not your servant. I put you here in a test. I'm testing you, ki menase Hashem etchem, to reward you in your end. Everything you do, you do for yourself. You're not doing me a favor. It's a sentence in the Torah. 
everything you do for your own benefits. למען יטב לך ולבניך אחריך. Let's hope we'll be wise enough that not five, six minutes from now when you go through the door, you'll go back to your, na- to your life, to your meetings, to your parents, to your apartments. You'll sit in front of the television and you forgot this night like it's over. Be alive! When all the fish are dead in the oceans, they're all coming with the waves to the beach. One fish that is alive, he swim to the other direction. Be that fish. Wake up and find out that the right way is only to enter the path of God. He knows better than you what's good for you. He told you certain things in a long run you can never lose by listening to Hashem. No Jewish person in a history, none, ever lost because he listened to his Creator. It's impossible because God say, I'm the God of justice. I will not receive any bribe, I always go with justice and pay everyone exactly what they deserve. Hashem, Yato Hashem, 